All to order. Welcome everybody. Grand Fork City Council meeting Monday, November 16th, 2020. Uh, we got Sherry. Roll call, please. Weigel? Here. Dockler? Here. Weber? Here. Mock? Here. Kwame? Here. Sandy? Here. Veen? Here. We have a quorum? Thank you. Let's uh, let's add it here. 1.2 Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor's announcements. We have just a, just a few. Uh, I think everyone... Uh, knows the impending uh, tough decisions that uh, the school board's going to have to make tonight and I think it's important that we support, uh, support one another no matter, uh, no matter the circumstances and then keep this town moving forward. Uh, I want to send out a thanks to Public Works after a much longer leaf collection uh, pickup season this year than last year. They ended up uh, collecting a total, looks like 1,110 tons of leaves and 678 tons of branches, so, so quite a bit there. And it uh, looks like they got all the snow removal and ice control uh, machines uh, up and ready to go. So definitely want to thank Public Works and all staff who's uh, kept all the services running for the city over this uh, difficult time. That's all for Mayor's announcements. Number two, awards, presentations, appointments, and proclamations. Tonight all we have is the COVID update. Um, I just got a short thing. I just wanted to, you know, we appreciate the, gov the governor's actions. Uh, He's been very accessible and supportive. I think, uh, you know, it was nice to see that uh, the measures that he took near, you know, pretty well mirrored what we already had in place uh, with only a few exceptions. So that, that does show that we were out in front of a lot of this. Um, so we certainly appreciate that. Uh, I sh you know, I share many of the parents' concerns over this, the schooling decisions and the, the youth sports. So we're going to be uh, working with the governor and trying to find uh, solutions for that uh, moving forward. And with that, uh, I'll pass it over to you, Todd, and you can run through. Sounds good. Uh, Sh Sherry updated the agenda late today, so I, I, I apologize in advance. We uh, lo we loaded some documents up on the uh, on the agenda for the COVID update. Uh, the first one here is, as you referenced, were the comparisons of the governor's executive orders uh, the, with and the state health officer's orders with the orders that have gone on for both the mayor, city council, and the state or I should say our county um, health officer. So you, you can see those. There's a series of documents. The mayor, as you noted, you did um, um, rescind all your orders so that we were in line with um, the governor and the state health officer. Most of those were very much in line with um, what we've had already done previously. I did add under, um, for further discussion, 4.0, whether the city council wants to rescind their resolution um, too. So I did add that late. That's up to you folks. And I would say this um, also further on this. Um, what are the root causes of why the city of Grand Forks has done what we've done? Um, there, there were four areas, as we described last week, um, with community spread. Bars, restaurants, events, and finally um, sporting activities. Okay, And so that's why we did move forward with the, the mayor's executive order last week. 
And it's good to see that across the state, you, you'll see in a very similar way, manner, those four root causes are what it, is what the governor and state health officers move forward to. So just want to let everyone know that. Today we have been receiving several calls regarding what does this mean for me. And so uh, people are well aware that this is impacting them from a business perspective. And we're working with the state of North Dakota to make sure we get the frequently asked questions and getting responses back on the various areas. Lots of discussion on things that are from bowling alleys to curling clubs to youth sports. And so we're, we're gathering that information and how they can continue forward with mitigating factors. Just so you know, widely known, we're very much in sync with the state of North Dakota on what we had done previously. And, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see where we're at two weeks from now with all the things that we've done um, moving forward. So uh, Mayor, unless there's any questions, I know Dan Gosta did a lot of yeoman's work trying to compare and contrast, and, and I left those edits in there so you know you knew what we've done locally with the states and how they, they compare and contrast. I won't go over those in details, but Dan's online, and uh, those documents are there for if you have any questions. I, I've just attached them all for, for your interest on that. So that's all that I have on that item. Well, Todd, I just I think it would probably be a good moment just to thank Dan. I think he did a ton of work, uh, both on getting those orders together and then uh, uh, helping out with Dr. Walls and everything else, too. And, and then uh, once the governor's orders came out, he worked hard to, to get those rescinded as well. So I think he, he put in quite a bit of work. So I want to personally thank him for all the yes. work he did last week. A lot of work with Dan and a lot of work with the county, both uh, Haley Wamstead, the, our state's attorney, uh, Dr. Walls, uh, Debbie Swanson, all working together between the city and county, just so you know that you may not see that uh, as we work, get to work behind the scenes, but it, it was synchronized quite well and we're working well together, so on that. Um, the next one, item is Ultra Health System um, Testing, Treatment, and Capacity Update. Um, Megan Compton is going to present uh, via Zoom, Mayor, if we could maybe uh, dim the lights, and I think she'll she'll do the update for the Ultra. my screen we can, and john if you could turn up the volume a little bit out here i can talk louder too todd if i need to that that sounds great thank you megan okay thanks todd um good evening mayor and council members so i have a short update um there hasn't been a significant amount of change since last week but i want to give you a sense of where we're at both on the inpatient the outpatient side as well as where we are at on both treatment and vaccines so give me just one second to get you guys out of the way and move my PowerPoint forward. Um, so as I talked about a little bit last week, we opened our new, our new curbside testing location at the Alara Center last Wednesday um, and expanded the hours. So Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and then on Saturday uh, mornings. And by taking it to the Alara Center, we were able to create two lanes and get 30 cars in um, to the covered area at one time. So. Over the weekend, we did see an increase in the number of tests completed and then even more as of today. So throughout the weekend, we had 30, um, or 354 tests completed and 955 calls to the hotline. Um, as of 3 o'clock today, when I checked, we had had 354 tests completed um, and 545 hotline calls just um, this afternoon or just throughout today. So we have seen an increase in the number of um, tests. Mondays are typically pretty busy. Um, and I think that they were certainly not finished by the end of the day. Um, there were over 400 scheduled for today. And that's fairly typical um, for a Monday. They typically are some of our busier days. Um, again, just sharing that we have our express locations open so that in the event that people need more than just a test but need to be treated or evaluated, they can be seen at those locations helping to keep people out of our ERs. Um, and, then, and then I'm going to jump a little bit, I talk a little bit about our inpatient status today. Uh, as I shared last week, we have seen an increase in the number of inpatients. We are down um, for, from where we were at the beginning of last week, but up from where we were at the end. So we have a um, total of 108 non-COVID inpatients, which has really been helpful. Um, this is lower than what we would typically see. And the fact that we have those have a lower number of those non-COVID patients, um, we're able to better staff um, when we see a surge in our COVID inpatient stays. So we're at 42 as of this afternoon, 
Um, of the 42 inpatients, 36 of them are general med and six of them are in critical care. We um, were seeing the same, same um, impact. So our hospital beds, our PPE, medications, ventilators, ventilators and testing kits are all um, fairly stable. We did today receive um, the rapid test from the state that we've been working in partnership with the city and the state on. So excited to um, implement different locations for those rapid tests to be used. We're still working through the logistics of where to best use them. There are, there are not enough um, to take all of our curbside testing capacity, but we know that there, there are um, certainly ways to, imp or to roll this into our testing where it can be best used. The rapid tests are meant for patients that are symptomatic and a good couple days into their symptoms um, for them to be really uh, effective. So the um, one thing that we still really are focused on is staffing. We have not um, had to bring back asymptomatic COVID positive nurses. I know I talked a little bit about that last week. We have um, gone through all of the different misc risk mitigation factors. We have a separate entrance identified as well as a separate break room and a separate bathroom, um, but have not been in a position yet to have to pull this trigger. So we're hoping um, to not have to do so and haven't had to do so yet. And then as I talked about just briefly last week, we have looked at treatment options, both on the inpatient and the outpatient side and wanted to come back and talk a little bit about that. So steroids and home oxygen are not new treatments. Those are things that we have been um, sending patients home on and been using in the inpatient environment as long as the patient meets the criteria um, for needing both steroids and home oxygen. And of course, every case is a bit different. There are also two other forms of treatment that we are um, looking to initiate with the support of both the government as well as um, others. So we will be opening a, an infusion center specific to COVID patients. And there's really two different um, types of treatment. The antibody treatment, which is allocated by the government, and then the antiviral medication, which is allocated through our typical distribution channels is separate. So the antibody treatment, um, there's really a limited number of um, treatments available. And so we don't yet have a sense of what allocation um, will look like at Altru, but anticipating a steady flow of those into the system. So we're really focusing on um, the most critical and, and the sickest patients. So that it likely in the beginning will look like the skilled nursing facility patients um, who meet other criteria and would therefore qualify for those types of treatment. And then just a quick update on vaccinations. So we have been um, given information from the state um, that we should be prepared to um, receive and administer vaccinations by mid-November. We have not yet received them yet, but um, still could at any point in time. And then Pfizer um, has also anticipated that they will have a vaccination out the first week of December. So this too um, will have some specifics in terms of allocation. We're anticipating that the focus, um, not just at Altru, but across the country, um, will be on those high risk workers and then the high risk populations first. So again, back to those skilled nursing facilities and some of the patients that are at higher risk. This one, this particular vaccination requires two doses within a 21 day period. And in addition to that, there are some challenges and part of um, what, what organizations or health systems across the country will be working with Pfizer on is um, this, the, both the transport and the storage um, require ultra low temperatures. And so in a state like North Dakota, um, that might work well, but they have to be in extreme, um, extremely low temperatures. So we have purchased the equipment um, to store them once we're able to receive them. It's essentially like a freezer, um, but do um, anticipate that we'll have to work through with Pfizer, um, work through getting those vaccinations transported to us. So I'm gonna stop there, it's just a quick update, but stop and make sure that I um, have touched everything that you guys wanted to talk about tonight and certainly answer any questions if you have them. Council, any questions or comments for Ms. Compton? Mr. Sandy. Hi, Ms. Compton, thank you again for the update and appreciate everything that Altru is doing for us. 
Um, it, I've seen on social media and I've heard anecdotally from people that uh, the blood bank is looking for people with antibodies. Is that correct? And where do people go to, to give blood if they want to donate their very special specimen? Yeah, um, it is true. Uh, they are asking for those that have antibodies, so those that have um, been COVID positive in the past. You can call um, the blood bank, or the blood bank location is on the corner of Demers and 42nd, excuse me, Demers and right across from where the golf course is. 34th. Demers Thank you. 34th. Demers and 34th. Um, it's right on the corner there. So you could certainly walk in. Um, but I would recommend calling first because they've got um, a schedule built so that there are certain time slots that you can come in. Great. I would highly recommend everybody go that has antibodies go and, and give blood. Thank you. Council, any other questions or comments for Ms. Cotton? Anybody on, on Zoom that wants to? All right. Why don't we uh, head on there, Mr. Phelan? Um, Mayor Bachinski and members of City Council, there was a discussion last Thursday regarding mental health. And so, um, first off, I've asked uh, Police Chief Nelson uh, to kind of give us an overview. We have attached some uh, statistics. And if you look at the statistics, sorry, can't talk, is uh, it's generally plus or minus about this, uh, equivalent to last year. But I've, I've asked Chief uh, Nelson to come and give us kind of an overview of what they're seeing on the street. So with that, Chief Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Phelan, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, uh, Chief Nelson, Grand Forks Police Department. Um, we had a request last week, I know it was brought up as to say um, what was, at least statistically, what was it showing for uh, mental health type of calls relevant to uh, COVID. So we kind of broke it down and looked and said, okay, what are some of the calls that we could look at that could be tied to mental health, such as you know, suicide attempts, uh, child abuse, neglect, disorderly con disturbances at on domestics and uh, mental health calls. And really, as you look at those calls, and if you look at what would be in your packet, there's not enough statistical difference to say um, that it's ha had a huge impact, at least on what we're tracking through our system. And in fact, you'll see some of them are down, some of them are flat. And uh, for the most part, there hasn't been any surge as uh, one may have expect. Um, anecdotally, uh, I think we see a lot of the things that maybe might not make it to a report. And keep in mind, um, unlike a scientific study, trying to pull data for these type of calls is extremely difficult because how something is tracked in a system, for instance, you can get you can get dispatched to a barking dog and it ends up being a domestic. You can get dispatched to a domestic and it ends up being two people playing a video game. So at the end of the day, it's really hard to track. Um, anecdotally and speaking with, um, you know, with my guys that are on the street, that uh, those intangibles that may not statistically show up, um, people seem to be, it runs the gamut. I mean, you've got some people that I know we've, the often overused term is COVID fatigue. Some people are just tired of it. Some, uh, you do have people, at least on the domestics that we're on, one stat you can't really tell is, yeah, domestics may be down, but the domestics that we're on, people are just fighting over things that normally you wouldn't have, but when you find out that neither one of them's left the house for two weeks, um, that kind of in and of itself makes things a little more difficult. And, and I mean, even, I'll be totally honest with you, as you, um, the often thing that's really not tracked statistically is, is even the mental health of, of the first responders. And I can say that um, the mental health of my people has been really well, and that's in no small part to the support of the mayor or city HR and the council support. And um, in knowing that if something was to happen or if they were to contract this, um, this pandemic, would creep into their family, which it has to many of them, that they've been supported by the city. So I think the uh, the strong mental health of, of the professionals that work in my department, um, in PSAP, the fire department, has uh, served the city well in, in keeping people safe. And uh, anecdotally, the people that we are dealing with, um, 
I think there's a lot of things in place that we've been able to, to get them to a much better place. So, I mean, overall, if you were to look at the stats, I'm pleased with, with where they're at. I know there's, there's a lot of things that always don't make a stat sheet as well. So I'm not going to paint a rosy picture where maybe one isn't warranted, but uh, the walls also aren't caving in. So I think, um, I kind of liken this to being when you deal with people in January and you've been through about a three week below zero stretch where people are a little edgy, but um, nothing really out of the ordinary. So with that in mind, um, I would stand for any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Chief Nelson. Thank you for the update. Uh, any questions for Chief Nelson, Council? All cool. right, thank you, sir. And then, Mayor, there was discussion regarding a, a potential mental health group. Um, and and I, I mentioned that I had received a, a, a email from Mental Health Matters, and I've attached some information, not only Mental Health Matters, Debbie Swanson, our public health director, also summarized a lot of the areas where people can seek help. help. Probably in the near future, and, and related to our CARES funding, this Mental Health Matters group, and that's made up of UND, the City of Grand Forks, the county, um, Grand Forks Public Schools and others, an assortment of other groups. I would, I would suggest to the City Council, we've already got a group, let's, let's not create more groups because the same people are doing many things. So my recommendation is to keep mental health matters in place. The second thing I've learned as I've gotten more engaged in this, we, um, I think my impression working for the City of Grand Forks, I've said this before, I thought we handed it off to the Grand Forks Public Schools. We, they never felt like we handed off uh, mental health matters to them, okay? that they see this as a coalition of partners working together. And I think we want to make sure we maintain that narrative and we don't assume something that's not true. And so really what they're going to ask, and I'm going to bring this forward as part of future CARES discussion, they, they would like to see a coordinator put in place. I've, I put a draft um, job description in place that Tangie Bovet, our HR director, put together. They're looking at maybe a $300,000 budget over three years. And that would help pay for the coordinator and some subsidiary things. So about 100000 a year for the next three years to keep things going, keep people coordinated. And so that request will come your way. Um, there's still going to, I think, be deficits in the mental health areas of how people are being served. But that is the request. You'll see that in the near future moving forward. But I want to just give you a status update on that. Is I think from the chief, we're, we're doing OK um, currently in our community. I think that's a good sign. Mental health matters needs more support. They're asking for a coordinator. And I think the city needs to take a lead on that, and maybe on funding through the CARES funding. And, but we need to talk to all of our partners about who can house that. Right now, public health is, uh, has other priorities. And if we can get another organization to take the lead, I think that would be my first option. But more to come on, on that. So I'll put a period on that, more to come. But that's kind of where we're at with mental health um, at this point in time, more to come. Okay, go ahead. So, Mr. Finland, I'm just, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, there's a, a report, a document here, um, Mental Health Matters. I assume this was a PowerPoint of some sort at some yeah. point. Is this a mix of old and new information? Yeah, um, Mayor Buczynski and City Council President Sandy, I think when I got the report here near the end of August, early September, it was kind of an annual, here's what we've done, and, and going forward, this is what we'd like you to help fund. And so it, it is a mix of the two, and I think right now their current request is to keep things going, is asking for assistance regarding uh, a, a coordinator. And I kind of held them off to say we may get some CARES funding, and that might be an opportunity for us to, to help fund, since we're the receiver of the funds and help the whole group mm -hmm. to do that. So. Um, I think we're at the moment of truth of deciding whether we can get forward. I did get an email the other day as I spoke of, and uh, one of the individuals say, hey, where are we at with that? And that's what I've said. So I just, the reason I'm asking is because it looks like when I followed along, the, the chief was talking about some statistics on calls for service, and there, that information is in here, and that appears to be updated information. Is that correct? Yeah, our information from our um, uh, PSAP and police is updated March to um, Equivalent periods of March to the, um, to current okay, on both of those. Okay. I'm, the reason I'm asking, which I was confused, is because under the planning committee, it still has Mr. Hagel listed in here. Yes. So I couldn't tell if this was last year's PowerPoint or if this was new. So it is a mixture of new. Yeah. That's okay. I, now I understand. So at some point in the future, that uh, that request for the 300000 100000 per year for three years will come 
at a future meeting and the source of funding for that most likely will be CARES Act funds. And the reason we're, we're suggesting that we come up with that money is because we are the recipient of the CARES Act funds. Very good. Yep. I am a big believer in, in helping with the mental health issue. Um, I think uh, Mr. Gockler does an amazing job at the school district. He should be commended for the work and effort that he's put in and certainly believe that we should help financially support them. Thank you, Todd. Mm -hmm. Yep, sure, Ms. Bach. Um, Todd, just to review, so when we first started the efforts, we were focused on opioid addiction, correct? And then it kind of morphed into the mental health matters, and that's where we were thinking it went to um, Grand Forks Public Schools, that they were kind of leading the charge a little bit more. So then we'd be taking essentially that same structure and all those different partners, and then essentially adding in the COVID um, stressors and different things that the community is facing. Is that what we're thinking? Yep. Uh, okay. um, Mayor Buczynski and Vice President Mock, I think that exactly what I've heard is, like a lot of things in our society, it's only accelerated um, challenges. It's only broadened cracks. And so it's just kind of one more layer on top of it. Um, my first choice, and, and I haven't asked him, but would be have yeah, the school district maybe be the lead and we provide them additional funding and maybe they can work with Mr. Gockler because he's really focused on the K through 12. He, he can't focus across the community at large. They haven't said yes to that, but that would be my first move to see if they'd be willing to, to take that on as one of the key member, kind of the lead stakeholder group, if they would be willing to. Sure, and then even if they didn't want to take that on, whoever would be put in this position would probably work closely with Mr. Gockler. Yes. And he would lead more from the school district, and then this person would be focused more on community-wide. Yep. I think we, what I heard from the group is not that they, have, they haven't floundered, but they probably need one lead. Institutional partners say, we'll, we'll take the lead on the community-wide. That might be the city, but we'll, we'll talk among the men. Before we come back, and I think it's going to be, as to Mr. Sandy's point, it will be before the end of the year, we'll come back with a request to move forward in the new year. And is there a way or, I, you know, public health has so much going on. I would imagine, like you said, it kind of exacerbates the cracks that are already there, but it would stand to reason that we would maybe be, need to be watching addiction and, you know, various um, food shortage issues or struggles with housing, like all of those things would probably be um, stressors that would be coming up in the next. Yeah. And I, I think that's what Public Health Director Swanson said, is they're, they're going to be a partner, they just don't have the bandwidth right now to, to lead it. And maybe a year from now they'd be able to, but right, right now. And I didn't even notice with the, the PSAP, it looks like addiction or um, overdose calls are up over last year. That's one area we're up, so we'll have to uh, keep our eye attached to that. Ms. Docker, I see you unmuting, please. Thank you. Um, Mr. Feeland, could you tell me for CARES Act dollars, just so that I can fully understand, if we use those CARE Act dollars to fund a Mental Health Matters Coordinator position, would that position be able to meet all of the kind of different things that is listed in that job description, or would it have to be specifically centered um, and focused on COVID-related issues, since it's CARES dollars? Yep. Uh, Mayor Bochensky and Councilmember Dockler, my understanding is that there are not um, restrictions to have to be COVID-specific. Uh, because the dollars have already been expended on via uh, law enforcement payroll, that that's available for uses that would really impact the community in a positive way. I think we can clearly point to COVID relates to mental health in our community. And I think we can further point to the other goal was to make sure that we're doing things that would be normally funded by our general fund, mm -hmm. our essential services. And this is another area where we, didn't, we wouldn't have funding necessarily that we would allocate to this area in lieu of having to raise taxes or to find other locally driven sources. So I, I think the answer is yes. Before we make a final recommendation, we'll, we'll make sure that's the case. Um, the other question I have too is that would the Mental Health Matters kind of committee, would they be responsible for identifying and setting up the uh, lead agency to house this coordinator position? Or are we talking about housing it within the city? Um, Meaning, is it a similar process that the WCR, the Welcoming Community Roadmap, is currently going through to find a new housing um, for the program? 
on the coordinator position? Yeah, Mayor Wachinski and Councilmember Dockler, I think the answer is yes. We would work within the community to find the best home, not only the best home, but the willing home for this. What I would like to make sure that we do, though, since the city is receiving these CARES funding, I want to hand it off to a like organization to the city of Grand Forks. And so if you look at institutional partners, whether it's all true, Grand Forks Public School District, UND, at least that's a government to government exchange. And I think that would be the best way to make sure that we, on the reporting side and, and, and executing the plan, we hand it off to a partner that we can rely upon. So we are looking at a different partner, not housing this position at the city at all? No, right now, I, th I think the impression was that the school district was going to move forward with this and kind of really leading coordinator. The feedback that I've gotten is that they're not, um, they don't, they never assume that and they don't necessarily want to be that. So I think that's why this committee has to further have some further discussions about who will be the lead agency. In that regards, there seems to be some confusion. So we'll get that righted. And I think we need that um, Mental Health Matters group to decide who should the lead partner be. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments, Mr. Veen? Yeah, just a question, uh, Todd. Um, I, I, this position sounds like it's really needed and I, I appreciate what you're doing. Maybe my question is, is are we gonna need additional services, uh, staffing beyond just a coordinator position? Uh, or is that something that would be determined later on? Because as important as this issue is, you know, the coordinator uh, is critical, but I would assume there'd be additional services needed. Uh, Mayor Wachensky and uh, City Council Member Veen, I think the answer is yes. When we first made the ask, we weren't, again, I know sometimes from time to time there's criticism of Governor Burgum. The fact is we didn't, weren't sure we we're gonna get any funding from the CARES and we find an innovative way that actually gonna be delivered in a block grant fashion without a lot of strings to cities like Grand Forks. So now I think we have more opportunities to fund things. And the other thing is we don't, we don't have time limits with expending the fund, funding too because it's already been expended. So there's a lot of win-wins. And so I think their request is very minimal. And um, you know we've thought of other ways to supplement um, whether it's you know grad students, undergraduate, undergraduate students, an intern or co-op kinds of things or just regular position. So with this, with your willingness to look at uh, kind of more of a robust way to engage on this matter, we'll bring that back to the committee and, and maybe um, since we have more opportunities to maybe expand the horizons on this discussion, within reason, of course. Yep. Thank you, Todd. All right, any other questions? I think it's, you know, it's a great, it's, it's probably, this is probably helping it move forward quicker than it would have on its own. So I think that's, that's great at the time that's needed. Any other questions on mental health matters? All right, Mr. Field. The next item is um, one item that's, that's come up both in the mayor and the administration's discussions regarding business activities. And we know the hospitality industry has been the one industry that's been impacted the most. And uh, last week, too, Council Member um, Vice President Mock, you, you brought up in a couple meetings, maybe we could look at ways, whether it's um, license fees, that we could really uh, target those industries that have, have um, been hurt the most. In front of you and attached, I have a, a memo along with a, a draft emergency owner and then some financial breakdowns of what we mean. Really what we wanted tonight is your feedback and your input. And this particular emergency order would allow for a 25% um, break on fees for license holders, both restaurant license holders and liquor establish, estab establishment um, license holders. We would do that in the, in the new year regarding that 25%. This is generally in line with what our comparable cities have done in Bismarck and, and Fargo. And there will be some um, revenue impacts for the city of Grand Forks and specifically our general fund. This can be another part of our, our COVID distribution discussion about whether we wanna look at ways in our own general fund to, to replace some of these revenues that are gonna be lost. We try to be targeted and not all license holders are included, whether you're alcohol or restaurant, and we try to focus in, in areas that we think have been hurt the most. And because uh, Sherry Lundmark here, our city clerk, it really is the expert on, on licensing. I asked her if she could kind of go through this document and just highlight the areas that are included and the ones that aren't included so you know that. And then we'd like to get your feedback. And the mayor didn't want to sign anything until he got some further input from, from U.S. City Council. So with that, I'd hand it over to Sherry, please. 
Okay, thanks, Todd. Um, so I looked at revenue in total, and we have a number of different classes of license. Um, I kind of broke that out on your on your handout. Um, at this time, we're not including looking at any type of a, a discount for class two establishments, um, mainly because they they haven't been impacted as much as as the other classes of license. Um, sure, could you tell us what class two is for oh, those that I'm aren't sorry. on a day to day wages? <laughs> class two is off sale only. Um, they've pretty much been able to function most of this whole pandemic without any closures or, or restrictions at all because they were deemed an essential business. Um, likewise, when we looked at the food establishment, we looked at just the ones for in person dining. Um, as they were the ones that were most affected by shutdowns. For the most part, the other food establishment license holders, grocery stores, um, meat market, bakeries, those were all functional. Um, may have seen some impact with, um, but not near what the in-person dining establishments were experiencing. So um, overall, if we you know, uh, applied this 25% off, um, you know, we'd be looking at $74,559 that we would be missing uh, in revenue from the general fund. Um, the impact varies depending on the amount of the license fee that the license holder pays. Um, it may seem like a small amount per license holder, but in some of those cases it might be just enough to give them um, a little bit of a break that they need. So with that, um, I guess if anyone has any questions about particular classes or, or um, any other restrictions, you know, let me know. And then I think it's, did you note out too that it's, it's extending the, the original deadlines at the end of the year and this one also allows for the, the payment on those fees to be extended mm -hmm. till the end of February, which I think is, is helpful too. Um, other cities are doing, I think it's, you know, we really probably impacted our liquor license holders, the ones that are listed more by having some early closing and some other things. So I think it's a way to, uh, to help. Uh, nobody's going to get made whole by this, certainly, but it's, it is something. So with that, I'd certainly take any more input anybody has on it. Mr. Sandy. I think it's a great plan, Mayor. Um, I think we start with this. Um, I would assume that by having this out there, we'll get some feedback from all sides, and uh, you can always reconsider if uh, you learn more information from people that is relevant, but I, I really appreciate that you're moving this forward. And it was a good idea that Ms. Mock brought, brought mm -hmm. forward last week. So. Any other input on the, the amounts or dates or anything on there? Or everybody's comfortable with those, those numbers? Ms. Mock? You said that Bismarck was looking at 25%? Yeah, I believe it. Bismarck and Fargo have the same. Is that right? Yep. They've already. I think they've already moved forward with a 25% discount at this point in time. All right. If there's no questions on that, I, I'm going to uh, next defer to Maureen. And there's two documents that are attached. Uh, we have good news. We received some more money, so we thought we'd go over those documents and uh, get your further feedback on that too in advance. So with that, I'd hand it over to Maureen. All right, thank you, Todd. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I'm going to um, share my screen here. As Todd said, we did receive another round of Harris funding. Uh, I have two attachments here that I'm going to just briefly go through this first one, and then um, I'll, I'll bring up the, the second more related to the Harris relief funding. But uh, this first document is our COVID grant expenditure tracking spreadsheet, uh, which just provides you an update regarding the different um, COVID um, grant programs and a breakdown of those expenses. With regards to the CARES funding, that's the highlighted column for you. Uh, we do expect um, funds in the amount of roughly $7 million in total of that amount. And I'm going to bring you to another sheet here I find oh. just one moment and I'll grab it. Okay, so this is our 
breakdown of our CARES relief funds. Um, to date, we've received a total of $5,868,000 and $428. The second attachment here breaks it down into uh, for you into four phases. Uh, the first phase, as we've already spoken about and allocated funds for, as you see highlighted there, um, we did receive that $3,625,000, um, roughly $3.6 million. And um, the discussion has been, and we've allocated as highlighted there um, for various needs um, of the city and, and also at the school and the health department. Um, the second round of funds now that we have received is roughly 2.2 million. Uh, that's 2,242,795. Um, what we looked at doing here is of course covering um, some of our expenditures um, and reimbursing for those COVID related expenses and also um, some additional um, overtime and technology cybersecurity um, expenses um, through the city. But we're also looking at some additional needs of our health department and looking at an additional allocation there for consideration of roughly $629,000. Um, as highlighted, you can see the remainder of the uh, what we had decided, what we had considered for the school district was a total of four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't do the an entire amount with the first allocation. With, with this two point two million that we've just received late last week, we can um, allocate the remainder of that um, four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. So that's an additional two hundred fifty-three thousand dollars for the schools, and then we're also looking at. Um, drive-through testing um, with Ultra at our Alara Center and covering the costs associated with that. Um, that's an estimate at this time, um, roughly $300,000 that we're setting aside for that need. But as you can see, we've broken this down into, into the four phases. Um, like Todd mentioned, we um, receive these care funds. They um, base it on law enforcement payroll. Uh, we do expect two more phases of funding for the months of November and December um, police payroll, uh, roughly $600,000 a piece for a total of 1.2 million. And that we would expect to be able to make monthly requests and receive those funds um, in the months of December and January. Um, some of the considerations um, of the future um, funds to be allocated here um, would be additional um, rental of the Alaris Center space for testing and, and vaccine and, and those drive-through um, testing. Mental health matters as has been discussed tonight. Um, looking at Ultra with the call center and testing expenses there. And also just to cover some shortfalls of the city um, through all this. Uh, and then also just for consideration as we talk through possible uh, COVID business impact grants. With that, um, that is all for consideration and we are very thankful that we've received these care funds. And like I said, we uh, anticipate to receive that additional 1.2 million um, based on that law enforcement payroll. But um, Todd Mayer and I are here for your questions and additional um, matters of consideration as we look forward with that. Thank you, Ms. Storstad. Uh, any Comments there, Mr. Mr. Sandy, please. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dorsted, thank you for that uh, good uh, rendition of where we've been spending our money. Uh, Mr. Phelan uh, and Mayor, I've been what I think is relatively vocal uh, here at council meetings and at committee meetings talking about how I believe we should dedicate resources to the school system whenever necessary to make sure that our students can stay in the classrooms and uh, I believe that that includes support for the school district for testing. I've mentioned it before, but I believe we should dedicate funds to test employees at a minimum. Um, in a perfect world, we could test every student, test them all for antibodies, find out which students and instructors have antibodies and give them a 90-day respite so that when one of their classmates comes down with the virus or they're a close contact, they don't have to sit out for two weeks. It will certainly help um, with the employees. We all know that Grand Forks Public Schools is having a very hard time keeping employees there. I don't know if there's a large number of employees that have had, had the virus. 
we could start with them and, and therefore it's a small number. We could help pay for the antibody tests for those we know that have tested positive. It can't be a huge number, but it certainly could be helpful. Um, I would be an advocate for expanding beyond that, but at a minimum, I think we should start there and try to talk to the public health officials, talk, talk to the public school, find out and let's make a plan. And then I believe we should help them by dedicating funds to that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, comments from council or any other ideas? Anybody online? All right, Todd, you can work Sounds with good. Mr. Sandy and Ms. Swanson and see if we can come yep. up with a plan. On we that. will, uh, Mayor, on your behalf, you will formally bring this allocation back so you will have another review. This is, you know, just us initially reviewing this over the last couple of days. Okay, so you will see this in front of you as part of a city council approval. Finally, uh, we have attached the dashboards. Uh, thank you, Michael Dulitz has um, um, attached his dashboard presentation. Also, thank you to uh, Melanie Parvey of our Waterworks Department. She did receive some updates regarding the wastewater samples and how it relates to COVID testing. It's about a week in arrears, it looks like to me. And again, that's where the city of Grand Forks, we're one of the sampling sites we sample. Uh, we get the samples off to the North, North Dakota Department of en Environmental Quality and then NDSU. I think NDSU is doing the analytics themselves, but it's been a, a partnership to do that. We're about a week behind, but it is interesting. I don't know all the details, but it, it does seem to follow what's going on in our, in our particular uh, community. So I attach those two. Um, I think Michael and, and Debbie are, are on online virtually. Um, I'm not, I think even Michael might be on either that or he's at the school district, I'm not sure. But if there's any questions on, on those attachments, Mayor and City Council. Thank you. Uh, were you going to go, did you want to do anything on the wastewater samples or were we? No, I'm just, for, just for information. Sounds good. Any, any questions or for consideration? Ms. Mock? Um, Mr. Phelan, with the wastewater samples, it looks like when you look at that weekly average, um, that there's quite a spike. So are we assuming that we're following that? You, so are we expecting that we're following the wastewater by a couple weeks or that our cases are preceding the wastewater? By a couple yeah, and, and again, I'm not I, I'm not an expert. I'm not a, a scientist in this area, but it, I know the data is a week old, and so okay. I'm not sure the lag time in wastewater samples versus where the virus is and, and that sort of, sort of thing. We have asked um, for there are representatives from the North Dakota Department of Envir Environmental Quality, and we've asked them maybe at some point they could present. They, right now, they're kind of really. I they're still say, understanding. They're, bit, they're I hate to use the word busy, but they're busy doing other things, and the, the folks at NDSU are doing a lot of stuff. So I think at some point at a strategic time where they have some moments, they could come and um, present, even if it's virtual, to kind of give you an understanding of what's going not only in Grand Forks, but throughout the state, what they're finding. And they could talk about some of the science of wastewater sampling and this COVID virus that I, I wouldn't have the ability to. But I, I will keep working to try to get somebody here for that. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? All right. Are we ready to go to three public hearings? Or? We are. All right. Moving on to three public hearings and second readings of ordinances. 3.1. Public hearing on resolution relating to the Municipal Industrial Development Act authorizing the issuance of revenue bonds on behalf of All True Health System and authorizing, authorizing execution and delivery of documents relating thereto. Thank you. Let's uh, let's do the public hearing first. So we'll open it to public hearing. Do we have any? Once, twice, no public hearing. Uh, questions or comments from council, Mr. Weber, please. Approval. Have a motion for approval. We have a second I'll, for Mr. I'll second, but I have a comment. Mr. Sandy, his seconds, please. Uh, Mr. Weber received a voice message today with some relatively outlandish uh, accusations related to Altru that he shared with me. I'm wondering if anyone else, is there anyone that knows anything about issues at all true? I don't know any, I haven't heard any. And so I don't put a whole lot of stock into a random voicemail from somebody that's unwilling to leave his name or phone number. But I feel like we should at least ask the question, 
Is anybody familiar with an ongoing investigation by the Department of Justice related to Altru? Mayor Bochanski, uh, there are representatives, I believe, on, on virtually online um, representing Altru Health System, if, if they're able to. Well, if, if there is ongoing issues, it would be nice to know. Uh, do we have some members on from, I don't know if they want to respond to that or they have anything to say on that. I don't know who the person is or what he's saying. If I know there's maybe another council member, at least I think uh, Ms. Mock also received some type of phone call. I, 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 I did. I did you. I didn't. I, did. <laughs> so I did not. Um, maybe they think you're a conspiracy yeah. theorist and I'm not. Mayor Bochensky, I think yeah. Mr. Mullman is on online. If and maybe just because it's been laid out there, maybe he could have, perhaps should respond. I don't know what direction to send him in on this one. I guess uh, do we, do we want him to entertain it, Mr. Sandy, or can we? Sure. Move on? Yeah. No. I'm, I mean, if Mr. Moment has anything right. that he thinks he needs to say, he should say it. But if not, let's move on. Mr. Moment, is there anything Altru is hiding from us other than phenomenal service? Please. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, no, it is not. Thank you. And Mayor, if I may, um, the agenda item before you, if we could just, um, when you are ready to make a motion, we're looking to adopt the resolution that's attached to authorize the issuance of the bonds. And, and as you see, we have um, two representatives for Altru, if you have further questions. Okay. Oh, Ms. Mock. Um, and if we approve the bonds, the city is not responsible for them in any way, is that correct? Mr. Please knock on uh, Mayor Butching see members of council. That is correct. There is no liability to the city with the issuance of these bonds. All right. We have a motion. Just can I uh, move approval? I, we got it. We got it. We got a motion, and I believe that was the correct motion, right, Mr. Weber? Yep. And we have a second. Okay. You don't think you need two tonight, then? <laughs> no, I don't. Not tonight. Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Opposed, same sign. That carries 7-0. Thank you. 3.2. Public hearing and second reading of ordinance amending the street and highway plan of the city of Grand Forks to dedicate right away on the plat of Northern Plains Potato Edition located in the northeast quarter of Section 5, Township 150 North, Range 50 West, Welly Township, Grand Forks County, North Dakota, and to give final approval of the plat. Well done, Sherry. I believe we might have someone uh, here if there's any questions. Otherwise, uh, if not, uh, let's open up the public hearing. All right. Public hearing is closed. Mr. Brooks is here to answer any questions, too. Um, anybody have any questions for Mr. Brooks on this one, or do you want to hear a, a quick uh, update on it? I'll move approval. All right. We got a motion for a motion to, let's look at this right, to approve the ordinance. This is Ken, I'll second it. Mr. Ken seconds. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Four action items. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull 4.2. Yep, we'll pull. We got uh, 4.2 pulled. Uh, Maureen was uh, going to pull 4.1. 4.0 is new. We should probably pull that. Was there any other, anybody wanted to pull? Otherwise, let's first get, uh, let's go through and get approval then uh, on the consent agenda for 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.8, 4.9. Can I get a motion? Motion for approval by Sandy, second by Mr. Weigel. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Opposed, same sign. Those motions carry. Then let's do, uh, Oh, did I miss 4.10 on there? Let's uh, let's do 4.10 real quick. Do we have a we got a motion for approval of Mr. Sandy, second by Mr. Weber. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Mm -hmm. those, same sign. That motion carries. Let's do our uh, two introductions of ordinances too. Does anybody want to pull those? Otherwise, we'll be looking for uh, a motion to approve 4.11 and 4.12. The introduction of the ordinance. Uh, we have a motion to enter and a second, a motion from President Sandy and a second from Mr. Kamami. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. 
Motion carries, 4.11, 4.12 carry. All right, on to 4.0, Mr. Phelan. Mayor Buczynski, members of City Council, I've attached um, your current resolution and, as well as Mr. Gossett has gone through and, and nuanced the difference between the state health officer's um, order versus the resolution. And um, what my request is, is if you want to dissolve your, this resolution, similar to what um, Dr. Walls did as your county um, health officer, he did uh, rescind his order over the weekend for the for his face covering or mask um, orders so that we're in line with the state of North Dakota and have uh, less confusion. So that's in front of you uh, this evening. And, and as you already have done, if the, the governor does, does, you know, rescind his order and you want to move forward, obviously the city council has an ability to, to move forward with a further resolution at some point in the future. All right, any, any input from uh, council question, comments on that? I move to rescind. Mr. Weber moves to rescind. Do we have a second? Seconded by Mr. Weigel. Any other questions or comments? Or we'll... Mayor Bashevsky, may I ask a question quick? Yes, please. Um, Mr. Thieland, I'm just wondering, or or um, Mr. Gosted, it may be your, your area too. Um, if we kept our city ordinance in place, wouldn't the states trump ours because of the enforcement measures that it has? I can answer that, sure, uh, Councilmember uh, Dockler. That would be uh, accurate. The the state's health uh, officer's order would uh, prevail. Okay, thank you. I guess um, the motion is already on the floor, but for me, it makes sense to leave ours uh, because the governor's is only set for a month, and yes, he can renew his. Um, but I just think instead of kind of yanking people back and forth, if the governor's already trumps ours, it would make sense to just leave it. Um, and if the governor rescinds his and we decide as a city that we want to continue ours um, and add enforcement, we also reserve the right by writing that into our resolution that we could do that. So I would be for keeping it. All right, thank you, Ms. Dockler. I think I can see both sides of the argument. I, I do think it probably carries more weight if we come back and, and do it again so it's clear at the end and, and gets rid of any um, ambiguity from two different orders, but uh, certainly can vote as you wish. It, it, Mayor Bajenski, maybe Mr. Goss, there were some questions over the weekend. The uh, governor's order is a um, infraction and it's not a class B misdemeanor. Mis and so there were some questions about whether, you know, what that all meant. We probably, we're gonna review that and kind of how the governor was able to do it and our health officer was. And so maybe, Dan, could you kind of give some highlights on what you're looking at regarding the, the governor's order versus what we did from a county health officer and then what we did locally? Yeah, the, the, um, the governor's order really uh, concerns um, occupancy and, and um, you know, matters within operation within bars and restaurants, special events, and, and that is an infraction if, they, if there's a violation of that. That public health officer's order is likewise an infraction. And, and I trust that everybody's got the comparison. I went through in detail and compared the resolution versus uh, the public health officers because they're those are the two that are that are connected with one another. Uh, to compare that uh, state health officer's order to the to the resolution, and um, in a lot of instances, the public health officer's uh, order is actually more restrictive. Uh, than, than the city council's resolution, or at least similar to the terms. Um, and that does impose uh, a penalty of an infraction, which is up to a thousand dollar fine, uh, it, as opposed to the resolution, city council resolution that doesn't have any penalty to it. And, and I guess uh, from, from the viewpoint of trying to have the citizens assure that they're following the correct order and making sure that we're we have some consistency here. Uh, the thought process, at least from, from my view, was um, to get rid of the resolution so that there's no confusion is that we're following not only the governor's order on occupancy, but uh, the public health or the state health officer's uh, order with respect to masks. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Gosta. Any other questions or comments? Ms. Mock. Um I, I guess I understand that, Mr. Gosted, but if we left 
So I guess I would rather not keep belaboring mass. So since we've made one decision, I guess in my mind, once the governor's order came, I assumed that that would take precedent over ours, but I also assumed we would leave ours in place so that we don't have to go through this conversation repeatedly. Um, so if we left ours in place, I'm a little uncertain as to why you think it might be confusing. Um, because I would think that while the governor's is in place, that one would be, um, I guess, more strict, and so that's what would be followed. And then if that were to come off at the end of the month, ours would then be there, so we don't have to have that conversation again. I can certainly answer, I can certainly answer that question, uh, Council Member Mock. It, it, there are just it, it, the language in the state health officer's order and the language in the resolution, there there are language differences, but if you take a look at the, I think the underlying intent um, between the two, they're similar or even more restrictive. So uh, that was just the thought process is just because there are, there are those nuanced nuance differences with respect to some of the language that's used in the resolution versus in the, the state health officer's order. Again, at the end of the day, uh, given that uh, the enforcement mechanism is going to be through the public or the state health officer's order, that's the one that's going to that that's going to be operative with respect to enforcement uh, mechanisms. Mr. Veen, did you have something? Yeah, I I appreciate this conversation because I think that there's probably good arguments made on both sides for why we would want to to uh, remove, I guess, this uh, city council action. Um, I'm just trying to think for Mr. Gosted, I understand all the, the uh, conversations and the debate that went through the first time. Um, if we do have to come back, and we don't know how long the governor would do keep his in place, we, we again would have to go back through that again. Um, so, uh, maybe it isn't necessary for you. I'm just wondering why there'd be, there'd be no harm, let's put it that way, in leaving it in for now, is there? For Mr. Gossett? No, I, from, a, from a, an enforcement standpoint, your resolution has no enforcement mechanism at all. Um, and so, it, I mean, it, it is, you're urging the citizens to, to uh, wear a face mask as opposed to the state health officer. It's a, it is truly a mandate that has enforcement uh, tied to it in a, and uh, um, so in that in that regard the, the again the state health officer's order would prevail um, you know and I you know could somebody I look to the resolution for some means I, I don't think that could be utilized necessarily as a defense if they violate the state health officer order because that really isn't applicable uh, in those type of violations so Again, the state health officer's order would prevail. Uh, again, my, my thought process was so that we had one operative document uh, at play. I, I do think the county uh, health officer, Dr. Rawls, has uh, you know made it clear too that he's willing to act if, if uh, say that the, the governor was to or the state health officer was to pull his. I do think Dr. Rawls um, has shown a willingness to to also act, but. Uh, you know, as you say, it has it has no uh, enforcement mechanism. So really, uh, I guess either way, uh, Mr. Weigel, please. Uh, just a point to Ms. Dockler. If, if she wanted to add an enforcement mechanism into ours, uh, we would be talking about it again, and it would come back no matter what. So I, I feel if we if we get rid of it at this time, it's it's the same. I mean, we're. We're going to be talking about it again here December 15th if it changes again. So either way, it's going to be brought back up. Yeah, and in order to add an enforcement me mechanism, you would have to go through two readings in the, in the process to change the ordinance to, to attach a fine to it. So uh, it's something to consider as well. But uh, any other questions or comments? All right, so we do have a motion uh, to rescind and a second. So all those in favor, why don't we just, should we just go down the line on this one so we have it clear? Uh, so the motion is to rescind. So a yes vote would be to rescind, a no vote would be to uh, keep it in place. Uh, Mr. Weigel? Yes. Ms. Dockler? Mr. Weber? Yes. Ms. Mock? No. Mr. Kwame? Yes. Mr. Sandy? Yes. Mr. Veen? No. 
Uh, where does that leave us? Maybe ask Councilmember Dockler. Maybe she's she muted. She's muted, but she would have been the third. We did have four yeses. Okay. Uh, the motion to rescind carries. All right. Uh, 4.1. Resolution awarding sale and directing issuance of 4695000 refunding improvement bonds, Series 2020A, and 1645000 refunding improvement refunding bonds, Series 2020B. Ms. Storstead, we've got some, uh, some good news on this front, so please take it away. Yes, thank you. I, I think you'll like this news that came in today. Uh, Mayor, members of council, uh, as you may remember, we uh, came to you in October to move forward with the issuance of bonds uh, for this year's special assessment projects, as well as the refinancing of our 2010 C bond issue. Um, as part of this process, uh, we set the sale date for today, which is November 16th, and these bids were received uh, by Baker Tilly. Um, the, the bid tab and resolutions are attached to your agenda. Um, just as a review, also part of this process, we've uh, taken part in a rating call with Moody's, the rating agency, and was communicated with you last week that we were very pleased that we maintained a variable fair, favorable um, AA2 rating uh, with a stable outlook. Uh, these good ratings, um, they really help bring in bidders and good uh, interest rates um, for our bonds. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Paul Steinman, who is attending via Zoom on this meeting and he'll go through those bid results with you that were received by his office today. Um, and when you are ready to take action, we would just be looking from you uh, approval of or adoption of the attached resolution awarding the sale of the bonds. But at this time, I'm just going to let uh, Paul share what I believe is good news on the interest rates that came in. Very good, thank you, uh, Ms. Dorstead. And good evening, Mayor and Council. You offered two series of bonds this morning at 10.30. Uh, your 2020A uh, was offered in the amount of $4,695,000 and your 2020B in the amount of $1,645,000. On the series 2020A, you had three bids. Uh, they were, they're on your bid tab that is before you. Uh, the true interest cost uh, bid by, by, by these three underwriters ranged from 1.83% to 1.91%. Um, a pretty tight spread, which represents um, um, a good competitive market this morning. Um, your best bid was FHN Financial Capital Markets at a true interest cost of 1.83%. Again, this is on your, your series 2020A. Um, in addition, you, you received uh, premium bonds uh, as offered by this underwriter. So those premium bonds, the, the premium, um, the amount of the premium was then used to reduce what you otherwise would have to borrow. Uh, so you set to borrow 4695000 Um after the bids were in, your bonds were downsized to $4,190,000. And after uh, restructuring, uh, the true interest cost uh, came in at 1.87%, uh, but uh, nevertheless, a, uh, an excellent bid. On your 2020 B bonds, you had five underwriters bid, ranging from 0.55% to 0.86%. Uh, best bid uh, on this refunding was Northland Securities at a true interest cost of 0.55%. Um, and this was, uh, this was a refunding of existing bonds. Uh, this refunding was being done because we foresaw some savings that uh, you could achieve through doing that. And also uh, that uh, the city had in its funds um, about $750,000 that in cash that could be put into this refunding in order to um, reduce the number of maturities from 2031 to 2027. Um, so uh, the overall savings, uh, present value savings related to the, just related to reducing the interest rate on these bonds, uh, present value is about $364,000 um, so an excellent 
a, a level of savings and excellent use of existing cash uh, resulted in a in a new bond that's four years shorter than the other bond and again excellent savings achieved all around uh, with that um, Maureen maybe I'll just sit, step back for questions thank you Paul yes with that and um, you know both Paul and I here are here for your questions otherwise um, the motion that we would be looking for tonight is adoption of the resolution that's attached awarding the sale of the bonds all right, thank you. Uh, any questions, Mr. Weber? I'll move. move to it for approval. We have a second. Second from Ms. Mock. Any other comments? No, I think it's great news. That's good to hear. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Mm -hmm. Opposed, same sign. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you. 4.2. Growth Fund Ordinance Proposed Changes. All right, I don't want to preamble too much on this, but I, I, I just think I've got to say something. Um, you know, I, I was kind of okay with it when I went through on Monday, and I, I, I wanted to clear up a few things. I think Mr. Weber had stated that both were unanimous decisions from the, the JDA and the Growth Fund, and as a member of the JDA, I think that that's not maybe the full truth, because I think had I thought it was going to be the same person on the Growth Fund, I wouldn't have, you know, you know voted on the JDA for the same. Um, but you know, it's certainly not, not about the person. Uh, you know, definitely I think uh, Mr. Weber uh, can do a fantastic job and has done a fantastic job, but I, I do think the, the, the two positions should be split up. And, and like I said, it has nothing to do with the person. I was uh, pretty dismayed to, to read uh, in the paper the day afterwards um, Mr. Weber's comments towards Mr. Weigel. Um, I guess I can quote them here. I don't know if he doesn't like his day job or what the problem is, but he seems ambitious and he has no business experience whatsoever. I, I just, I, personally, I find a, a certain amount of uh, elitist arrogance to that that, that really was troublesome, um, to, especially directed towards a, another uh, council member. Um, I, I do hope amends have been made uh, on that, that front. Uh, with that being said, it, it, it isn't about the person. At the end of the day, it's, uh, it's just setting up a proper form of governance. Um, I do think the left hand can easily talk to the right hand in this case because it would be a, a member of uh, the board either way. Um, and to, to Mr. Veen's point uh, on Monday about our hands being tied, if we write this in the ordinance, I, I really don't see what the, the worst uh, thing is that could happen there if we had a different person running uh, both of the, both the committee that's uh, setting the agenda and then the JDA which is approving that, that agenda essentially. Um, I find the opposite to be, to be more concerning. Um, Mr. Weber often speaks of a healthy tension within government. I think uh, that's not quite a healthy tension if you have the same person uh, chairing uh, both the JDA and the Growth Fund Committee that it recommends there. But uh, I'm interested to, to see what, uh, what council thinks. It was a 4-3 vote, so it was close. So we'll have to see how we move forward on this one. Thank you. Any comments? Mr. Sandy? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've done a lot of self-reflecting. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm going to be brutally honest. I was really upset last Monday night after the meeting, and even more upset Tuesday morning. Uh, I think we're all under too much pressure to be to be putting pressure on one another. Uh, you know, I personally feel like I've got lots of weight on my shoulders like I'm sure all of you do worrying about the people of Grand Forks every day and our families and our jobs and I'm a little bit dismayed that so much stock has been put into something that truly is so very benign um, so with that in mind I thought I'd make a suggestion which will probably make most people unhappy that are in here and my guess is that will mean that it's probably right on the mark where it should be in terms of a concept that would make sense um, before making any sort of a motion on 4.2 I'd like the city attorney's uh, 
opinion. I'd like to have some understanding as to what direction he understands he's been given related to the JDA and the the uh, city ordinance related to the JDA. Mr. Gosted, are you have you started working on drafting um, any sort of a language in, for the uh, JDA that talks about the mayor not being able to be the chair of the JDA? Um, no, that uh, the um, from the the uh, committee the whole last week, I was under the understanding that um, the chairperson of the growth committee would be from one of the three members of the city council that were appointed uh, to the growth committee, and and I drafted a revision of the proposed ordinance, and I emailed that out. Um, actually the the night of the uh after the uh community of the whole meeting and that's that's the uh the document that i believe is in front of you yeah yes thank you I, and i appreciate that you did a very good job capturing the discussion uh from the committee of the whole meeting but we also had discussion related to the jda and related to specifically the mayor not being able to be the chair of the jda are you putting together that draft language for us? I, I, I certainly can. Uh, and, and bear in mind, uh, Council Member uh, Sandy, that amendments can be made between the first reading and the second reading. So that certainly can be uh, added to the, uh, um, the ordinance amendment to, if that's the direction. And, and if I missed it, then, then I will take responsibility. I, 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 I didn't take away from those meetings. That was the direction that you were asking for. I, I'm not saying you missed something. I'm just saying that I believe we had that discussion. And if it, if it possible, I would, I would like you to um, draft that language um, for ch amending city code. But with that, I'd like you to uh, amend Grand Forks City Code uh, of 1987 Chapter 24, Article 1, Paragraph 24-0106, in addition for it to say that the chairperson of the JDA board cannot be the mayor, I would like you to specifically say the chairperson of the growth fund board shall be the Grand Forks City Council's vice president, and from that there shall annually be elected a vice chairperson and secretary treasurer from among among the directors that does multiple things it leaves the opportunity for the growth fund board and the growth fund committee to have the same chair which is what mr weber wants it also provides the opportunity for the growth fund board and the growth fund committee to have different chairs because as we know the grand fork city council president nominates the three growth fund council members so the president can nominate the vice president to be on the growth fund committee, but the council mem membership has to confirm that. And if the council membership is concerned about having the same head of the JDA as well as the growth fund committee, the council membership can reject that nomination. I do personally believe that more often than not, having a, a second set of eyes on the growth fund items is better for the council and the JDA which is why I like this concept. And as Mr. Weber noted last week, it's important that each organization gets the opportunity to cho choose its own leader. So I'm prepared to go either with or against the uh, document that we have in front of us today. Um, if we move this forward as it sits, and Mr. Gosted comes to us with these changes to city code, it will accomplish both goals. It will increase the number of the membership of the growth fund. I would presume with that change that our current vice president would then become the chair of the JDA and we would retain Mr. Weber as the chair of the growth fund. And then two years from now, when I'm waving goodbye, you guys can all decide who you want to be in those positions. So, I, I don't know if 
if that makes sense or others want to comment on it, but I'm happy to make them. So first of all, Mr. Goss said, will you draft that for me? Yeah, and I would use the council member saying, I want to make sure I understand because you're, you're, there is a term of art with respect to the, the, um, the JDA is called the growth fund. fund. The growth fund. And then there's a growth fund committee. And the JDA um, is governed by a board of directors. Right. Uh, which consists of all members of the city council. And the JDA is to elect a chairperson, a vice chairperson, and a secretary treasurer on an annual basis. Correct. I would like to change that so that the vice president, the council vice president, is by definition the chair of the JDA board of directors. And then we would, we would annually elect... Uh, a vice chairperson and a secretary treasurer. This okay. may no, go nowhere. People may not agree with this plan, but again, I believe it accomplishes everything that everyone was concerned about. Well, it removes the, the any worry of the mayor being it as well. So. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. It does. So I can I can certainly. You thought you were going to make everybody upset. Yeah, you haven't made me upset. Well, this I way. don't know. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see where this goes. But that's I would. I would like, as, as long as others agree with that, I would like to see Mr. Gosted um, make that update to city code, and then I would move approval on the draft as provided. So that's a motion looking for a second? That is a motion looking I'll for a second. I'll second that motion. Great. Well, I think for where we were headed, I think that's a pretty impressive turn, so I appreciate that. I think you've managed to possibly make a compromise that everyone can be happy with or not happy, or not happy with maybe miss mock doesn't want to take it though we should maybe ask her but she might not have the choice so <laughs> any other comments on that uh council members miss mock all right uh, I, I have one question uh, hold, mr veen we got miss mock first and then we'll go, get back to you i was just going to say i still um I still don't have a problem with committee members on the growth fund committee being chair. So I guess that concern remains for me, so. All right, Mr. Veen. Uh, may, a question maybe for Mr. Gosted. If this is voted on, when does it go into effect? And what uh, does it do with those individuals that, that are currently in that position now? What happens yeah. then? Yep, I think that uh, it would go into effect upon the second reading and the signature, well, and the mayor has to sign as well, uh, assuming it passes and the mayor uh, uh, signs it. It would be effective um, at, at, at that time, and I think there would have to be uh, a change because I don't think somebody that's sitting as the JDA chairman could sit if they're not then in uh, the vice president of the council. There'd be an you'd be operating inconsistent with the uh, uh, city ordinances. Um, okay, that's that's good to know. One of the things that I was hoping would happen is is whatever change we would put in would be effective um, when we have the next vote instead of removing somebody from office at this point in time. So that was one of my concerns. The other concern that I have is what I've seen, which is seems to make for a really good distribution of power uh, is when you have your council president, your council vice president, and I think the chair of the JDA committee working in unison together um, to kind of be a core representative of city council when we're talking about many of these other issues that come along, especially with development. So it seems like combining the the vice president uh, and the chair into one position kind of consolidates that. I, I've appreciated that cross section in the in the past. It, generally, I like that concept, Mr. Sandy, that you do that. That kind of just identifies that. Um, I just don't know if that should be automatically that person because when you then vote for the vice president, you're actually voting for two positions at the same time. 
And is that your intent, Mr. Sandy? That is 100% my intent. Absolutely. People, the, the positions of leadership on the city council are very important. People need to take them very seriously, and, and not that they don't. I just, I believe that uh, this is a very good path for us to get, in my opinion, more often than not, you will end up with a different chair of the JDA than you will of the growth fund committee. I believe that's important, and I believe by doing this, it gives the council members two shots at deciding whom they want in leadership positions because A, they have to vote for the president who nominates for the growth fund, B, they have to vote for the vice president, and C, they have to um, uh, agree with the nominations that the council president makes for the growth fund committee. So there are lots of bites at the apple. I think it, I think it meets all the the concerns that were raised last week. Mr. Gostad, is that uh, something you can make happen? Uh, it it's, uh, sounds like an easy task. Uh, it's modifying the, uh, the, just the, be modifying 24106 that talks about the election of officers and simply uh, state, as Mr. Sandy had pointed out, that there'd be an election of a vice chairperson and secretary treasurer and the election of the uh, vice president of the city council would be then become the elected chairperson of the JDA. So I can get that done fairly quickly. And, and then next council meeting, that would be the second reading for that ordinance. And we would, could even make an amendment at that point but at that point, it would become essentially an ordinance. So we would have another crack at it, or does the second reading need to be the exact same language? The second reading would be the, uh, the operative reading. There wouldn't be, uh, um, I don't believe you could do a, a, you can do amendments between the first and the second reading, but not, not at the second reading. Okay. All right, any other comments on that? All right, well. We have a motion and a second. Why don't we uh, just go down the line again? Uh, yes or no? Mr. Weigel? Yes. Ms. Dockler? Yes. Mr. Weber? Yes. Ms. Mock? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, <laughs> in, in true leadership fashion, <laughs> she votes no. That's great. Uh, Mr. Kwame? Yes. Mr. Sandy? Yes. Mr. Veen? No. All right, that carries 5-2. All right. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Thank you. All right, where's my agenda here? I think we're through action items, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And no informational items. Citizen comments? Uh, any citizen comments? Anybody downstairs in A102 today? No? All right. Seven, approval of minutes and bills, 7.1. Vendor list. We have a motion to approve the vendor list and pay the bills. Mr. Sandy motions. We have a second by Mr. Weigel. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Vendor list is approved. 7.2. Minutes from August 31st, September 8th, and September 14th. Council motion please. to approve a couple of those minutes. Great. Mr. Weigel motions. Mr. Weber seconds. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aye. I think he was in favor, but it carries. All right. Uh, eight city administrator comments. Two Mr. updates, Dillon. Mayor Bochanski. Um, as you recall, we've done four pre applications on tax incentive projects. Um, and as you recall, also as part of that local government advisory committee that hears on those, that's our president, um, who's. Uh, Mr. Sandy and obviously a vice president, uh, Ms. Mock, are our representatives along. And then we have representatives from the county, um, school district, and then um, the park district, even though the park district is wrapped into ours. We anticipate, we're working with ba Baker Tilly in our third party um, financial analysis. We anticipate perhaps by mid-December to have some recommendations to that committee. So th those are moving forward. And as we call those four projects that, um, that we move fo forward with were the Lions Project, the St. John's Block Building, Epic Development, which is the townhouse redevelopment in Memorial Stadium. Those are um, total up to be uh, a little over $100 million. So 
I would anticipate from December to January those projects moving um, forward, so I want to um, put that on your radar. The second project that we're working on, we did submit the EDA construction grant for the Grand Forks Herald building um, for that uh, moving forward with a uh, entrepreneurial type center and accelerator. We anticipate getting final word from the EDA in mid-December too, so I think um, those four mixed-use development projects, three of which are in the downtown and that EDA grant we anticipate having additional information by December that will inform you on that. So with that, Mayor, nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. Nine Mayor and Council Member comments. Mr. Weigel, any comments tonight? Uh, just if we leave now, we can catch the start of the Vikings game. So uh, <laughs> I'll be, that is my only comment. I'm Skull Vikings. All right, Ms. Dockler. Just a couple of things. Um, Mrs. Storstead for 4.0, could the record show that I voted no? Um, Apparently, I was very unmillennial and had my mic muted. Uh, and then the other part that I wanted to share is that I've reached out to some colleagues locally in Grand Forks and then across the state to start working on some virtual trainings and um, some tangible toolkits for frontline workers at, at our nursing homes um, and across the state in those essential work jobs to deal with grief uh, during the time of COVID. Uh, as Mr. Weigel had brought up at one of our last meetings on Thursday, he was worried about mental health. I think this is something that could really be beneficial to put kind of these kinds of um, things and concepts into layman's language and take it out of the social work counselor vernacular. Um, not that people aren't uh, able to kind of figure that out, but if you put it in a way that is um, easily accessible and easily disseminated, I think that it will do a lot of good for our community. So we're currently working on that and I'll be happy to give you updates as we move along with it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dockler. We certainly appreciate all the work you do on that. Mr. Weber. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, let's go to Mr. Kwame. No, thank you. All right, Mr. Veen. Yeah, just one very quick thing. I had an opportunity to meet with, uh, with Mr. Phelan and the mayor to talk the potential of a COVID uh, response plan. We are gonna carry that conversation on further. I appreciate their time to meet with me and have that discussion. So look, more to come. Thank you, Mr. Veen. Uh, Vice President Mock. All right, and, and future possible JDA president, I, <laughs> chair, all right. Mr. Uh, President Sandy. Mr. Mayor, appreciate the nice discussion tonight. Uh, the, all the CARES funding and all the, the updates that we received at the beginning of the meeting. There are a lot of moving parts in our community right now. Uh, I, 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 I wish for everyone to take a deep breath because life is hard right now and it's not gonna get a lot easier really soon. But uh, based upon the email messages and both, well, mostly hate mail and mostly hate phone calls, people are very upset on, on all sides. And so I, what I, if I could stress to anyone, to everyone that would listen, take a deep breath. You can completely disagree with someone's opinion and still be friends. That's okay, right? I just wish everyone, I wish everyone well. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, President Sandy. I think we're all uh, interested to see what the school board uh, decides today. And, uh, you know, I mean, kind of echoing, I, I kind of like where, where President Sandy was going with that. I think this council has, has shown a tremendous willingness to, to work hard and do the best that they can under a, a very, very difficult situation. And I can certainly say that uh, after all the emails that all of us have received and, and just knowing the people up here, nobody wants to see anybody die. They, they have the care for life just like everybody else and it's a balance that we're all trying to do that the whole country's trying to do but uh, certainly everybody you know taking a second and, and, and trying to remember the good things and be grateful for what you do have I think is is important at a time like this so I'll leave it at that and we can get home uh, and see our kids before they go to bed one night uh, on a Monday so thank you we got a motion to adjourn we have a second from Mr. Weigel those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. we are adjourned aye.